Welcome, friends, to the Generations Broadcast. My name is Kevin Swanson. I'm a homeschool father of five. We're raising our children out here in the eastern plains of Colorado. During the decline of Western civilization, the breakdown of faith, family, and freedom, the breakdown of education, the breakdown of the character of the nation, and uh, inevitably we're seeing a breakdown of our systems because of the breakdown of, of the character of the nation. That's kind of the core issue. That's why we continually get back to the solutions, the biblical solutions provided in the Word of God, and that ultimately is parental involvement in the education of our children and the teaching of the fear of God as the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, as the beginning of character, the very, very root of character. And if schools proposed for pound to teach a little bit on character, but will not teach the fear of God as the beginning of character. That's a a joke, just a joke. You're not going to get character sans the fear of God because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge per Proverbs 9, 6 and Proverbs 1, 7. Well, friends, we're going to talk a little bit more about education today. Uh, Common Core apparently is something that uh, is is the latest and greatest from uh, the top. That is the centralized system, the National Department of Education, trying to impose this on school districts all around the United States. And this has been happening, Dave, since roughly Goals 2000 was attempting it in the 1990s, then on to uh, No Child Left Behind, and now it's Common Core. It's just one new project uh, the emperor's new clothes makers are putting together after an, another. I mean, you, you have to get some new brochures out at least every five to six years. I mean, let's face it. If you're going to, if you're going to, you know, fake like you're trying to solve problems as the emperor's new clothes makers are like to do, then you're going to have to need some decent propaganda. Well, Kevin, I'd say this has been going on since, well, well, since the 80s when Ronald Reagan wanted to shut down the Department of Education. I don't know if you remember this. It was one of his objectives was to get the federal government out of education, get it back to the states and to the people uh, rather than have a federal bureaucracy overlooking it and trying to coordinate it. But it was Bill Bennett who convinced the president after he was given the job of shutting it down and, and told Ronald Reagan, no, you can't shut it down. It, it'll create riots in the street. The, Awful things will be happening. Uh, people will be uh, rioting. Kids will be uh, doing kid-like things, and dogs will be sleeping with cats. And so Bill Bennett actually convinced Ronald Reagan that what we should do is instead try and get in front of the zeitgeist of the public education uh, push and to try and direct it. Well, ever since uh, we didn't shut it down, it's grown, it's grown, between, it's grown, it's grown. Between 2000 and 2008, Dave, remember that the size of the Department of Education, at least as far as its funding is concerned, tripled in size. That is, friends, during George W. Bush's reign as George the Second. As President of the United States, between 2008 and 2008, the size of the Department of Education tripled in terms of its monies and the amount of money that is appropriated to higher education, I think, increased at a rate of 600%. And that was no child left behind, right? Yeah, that was between 2000 and 2008. And in case people think that uh, Republicans are like to decentralize, they're not. They don't. I thought, but I thought no child left behind was unconstitutional because it dealt with the rapture, right? These kids are going to be left behind. No, no, no. That, you're you're confusing. Yeah, that's the other thing. Oh, no. This is this is. I don't think he Did borrowed I have that, that wrong? from Tim LaHaye. Okay, okay. I I don't think so. I mean, maybe I just assumed. No, I think you just assumed that. All right. Um. So Common Core is the latest and the greatest. And Dave, it's um, it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. Now, my, my my major problem is the centralization of education is no way to solve education's problems. And uh, many of you have heard my take on that, but you centralize control over anything, you're going to wind up destroying it eventually. And that's what's happening, friends, because the system of of centralization and standardization that's been imposed upon our children, our schools for the last 30, 40, 50 years has, has not produced good results. It's never produced good results. And it has continually disenfranchised local control and family involvement, parental involvement in the education of children. For this reason, it's a bad idea. Just that simple. It's just that it's just a bad idea. Now, of course, the centrists and socialists come back and say, no, no, no. Salvation comes from highly powerful centralized states. You know, Orwellian state needs to take care, take over everything. And at that point, it can it can establish standards for education that will solve all problems for everybody. But as it turns out, God doesn't make everybody equal. 
It doesn't, it doesn't uh, make everybody the same. We don't come out of the womb all with the very, very same gifts, talents, and abilities. And uh, people learn at different speeds, and uh, they have different learning patterns. They, have different, uh, they need different teaching approaches. And if you try to centralize, as we have seen since the 1880s and 1890s when you had districts that formed around these little one-room schoolhouses. And oh, by the way, America became the most powerful nation on earth on the backs of one-room schoolhouses and homeschools. Don't forget – but then in the 1890s and the early 1900s, we had uh, State Department educations that formed out of the local districts and then out of the State Department educations. Uh, you, we had the, uh, the great big old National Department of education that formed in the 1970s, and that's just grown and grown and grown, as David said, since then. And now we have these large centralized systems, and we have the highest illiteracy rate probably in the history of the nation. If we look back into the 1700s and 1800s, Uh, you find that people were pretty literate in general, and and people understood really big words, and they could follow really long sentences. They remember the time that I compared the Barack Obama State of the Union address to the presidential address of George Washington from the 1780s? I compared them on the little uh, grammar check that you can do on uh, Microsoft Word and found out that uh, Barack Obama was speaking to eighth graders, and uh, and George Washington is speaking to 16th graders or whatever. I mean, there he's, you know, college graduates. And, and, and that's the that's that's just because people were educated before the big shot showed up. Well, I think when you look at education, you have to view it a, a lot of different ways. And one of them is it's big business. Education is a huge industry in America. And it's not about academics. No, I no, no. We all know that. It's not about academics. It's, it's not about academics. What's John the, Dewey said it's about socialization. Well, that's John Dewey's view. But just from a purely economic standpoint, the industry exists for profit. In other words, the industry exists to make money. The education establishment exists for the purpose of getting money, for, for receiving money. That's what the NEA, and they say this, they, they, they make it explicit. They want more money, always more, more, more. And, uh, How do you get more money in the education establishment? Well, you can't have poor people paying for private school. They don't have the money, but but you can have cities and counties and states paying more money per student in order to enrich those in the education establishment. So as a business model, it's a model where the metric that is the success has absolutely nothing to do with the profits. That's a recipe for disaster. And it could affect homeschoolers. Dave, according to Heritage.org, they've just released a new report that states that the new Common Core alignment by the ACT, SAT, and GED exams raises questions about the impact Common Core will have on private and homeschooled students and their ability to opt out of federally incentivized standards that they want to apply to college. Um, so that's that's the latest from the Heritage Foundation. Evidently, the SAT, the ACT, the GED, you know, all of these Major tests are going to be aligned to the common core. Therefore, this is checkmating the entire system into a very narrow approach to education. And you're going to have to test to the 147 things that show up on the common core exams won't and the it. SAT and the ACT, or you won't fit into the system. And uh, it won't do it. It absolutely won't do it because there's still some colleges, there's still some universities who are looking for the very best students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They and, don't, and they, they don't will want the look water where the good them. students are, and they're yeah. not going to look for the common core kids. Yeah, if they're going to water down the SAT and the ACT and the GED to some really, you know, politically correct common core curriculum, and then they test to all of this, then then in the end, Dave, I think they're going to have impoverished education. And uh, thankfully, there are many colleges and many other approaches to the education rather than, you know, spending $140,000 to make it to a, a typical university, a secular university, and then get out with a 50% unemployment or underemployment rate in three to four years after graduation. There are better ways uh, to prepare your children for life than that. And we discuss these things all the time on the Generations broadcast. Anyway, my friends, we'll be back in just a moment with more on Common Core. What's the problem with Common Core? We're going to address that issue next on Generations. This is Kevin Swanson. Folks, one of the passions we have on this radio program is to see a Malachi 4 revival in the hearts of fathers and sons across America. 
I believe this is the catalyst to the restoration of faith, family, and freedom in the 21st century. And that's why we are sponsoring our Father-Son Retreat in Colorado. And folks, we have selected the most inspiring, visionary speakers we can find for this Father-Son Retreat. And you will enjoy inspiring talks, Father-Son Olympics, hiking, swimming, sports, and most importantly, time away with your son in the Colorado mountains. The event takes place at one of the very best mountain resorts in Colorado, the Crooked Creek Ranch, nestled in a stunning mountain range near Fraser. Please register today at check.org on the web for this once-in-a-lifetime experience for you and your son. That's check.org on the web, C-H-E-C dot org, or call 877-842-2432. That's 877-842-2432 to be a part of the Father-Son Retreat. Welcome back to the Generations Broadcast. Kevin Swanson with you here. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been involved in education for a long time. I've taught in public and private schools. I've taught in college. I've uh, been involved in the homeschooling movement for now about, well, probably 44 years. But uh, as a leader in the movement for roughly 15 years with Christian Home Educators of Colorado. So I'm interested in some of these education issues. I think the, the ultimate battle for the future, the battle for the hearts and minds of the next generation happens within education, probably more than anything else. And, and the other side's been winning for a long time because most Christians don't engage the battle in education. They don't want to talk about it. They want to head their, hide their head in the sand. They don't want to deal with it. And so they just send their kids out to public schools and hope and pray that something turns out, kind of, sort of. Okay, but we don't, we don't do that in this program. We talk about education a lot. And here's Common Core. According to Phyllis Schlafly, it won't make kids any smarter. This is something she wrote just a month or so ago. The CC English Standards replace about half of the readings in literature with informational materials. Uh, the students were assigned to read selections on the fate of Taino Indians and from a diary supposedly written by Christopher Columbus's cabin boy. They're, um, they're ex- it's explained to them why uh, Columbus should, be honor- should not be honored uh, with a state holiday. Also, uh, Common Core gives leftist educators a backdoor for bringing left-wing activism into the classroom. No surprise there. Um, NPR reported that one veteran teacher, Melinda Bundy, replaced her popular unit about King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table with one about President John F. Kennedy in the 1960s because she said she adored JFK. Comic books, graphic novels, formerly considered useful primarily for underachieving students and poor readers as a means to get them interested in books, but now Common Core is bringing picture books into the mainstream of education. And I've seen some of the examples of graphic novels, Dave, uh, very graphic descriptions of teenage kids having sex and things. Um, so this is the kind of literature, you know, that kids are going to be reading. Uh, new science standards called Next Generation Science Standards as part of Common Core were examined by nine scientists and mathematicians for content, rigor, and clarity, after which the Fordham Institute gave them a grade of C. They criticized the ceiling on the content and skills that will be measured at each grade, the excluding of content that more advanced students can learn, the failure to include essential math content That is critical to science, learning, and physics, and chemistry, and the confusing wording of the standards. So no surprise there, Dave. They're watering things down. Anytime we standardize, anytime we centralize, anytime we try to get all 140 million students marching in lockstep with the 1984 Wellish government in Washington, D.C., by way of the education program, you're probably going to have to go to LCD, the lowest common denominator, for the kind of educational content you use for the masses. So unless you... Will tailor make the education for each child, which homeschools can do, unless you say, hey, we're going to maximize on the individual talents and abilities that God has given each of our precious children, and we're going to uh, d- determine that by way of, of, of hanging out with them and for over a period of four, five, six, seven years, get to know them, get to know their learning styles, get to know what they're good at, what they're not good at, and tailor make the education for that child, unless unless you do it in the homeschool environment with four to five kids at a time, friends, this, this whole idea of mass producing kids through a massive centralized standardized system is going to render junk at the end of the assembly line. I'm telling you, that's the way it happens. I worked in manufacturing as a quality manager for a long time. And one thing you know about quality is if you're going to get quality material uh, out of the black box, you better make sure that everything going into the black box during the process is sized and shaped 
exactly alike. Otherwise, you're going to get junk out the other end. So if you're in a black box education, you got to make sure everything coming into the process is sized and shaped and thinks exactly alike. If it doesn't, you're going to get junk out the other end. And that, my friends, is what is going to happen with our education systems and has been happening for multiple, multiple, multiple generations. You violate the principle of individuality and you are going to be in a heap of trouble over a long period of time and a lot of kids are going to get ground up and spit out and there's going to be a lot of illiterate kids as a result of a standardized and centralized system and this is exactly what we're seeing hey dave here's one more example um apparently they're tossing out beowulf uh beowulf's no good anymore uh, as part of the standards proponents of evolution man-made climate change are ecstatic about the new common core science standards okay it's not rigorous in terms of science Okay, It's not rigorous in terms of science. They're not teaching the good chemistry and physics or the math appropriate for it, but they're also teaching the politically correct stuff. And it just, oh, it just makes makes the liberals so excited. Think about what Al Gore is going through right now. So they replace science with science fiction in that way. They've brought in the whole literature curriculum at the same time. It's more fun, yeah. You know, because you could just just watch episodes of Star Trek. Sure. And that would count as both your math and And your science and fine arts and literature and everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If only we could find those those crystals that could we could build our warp drive with. Uh, Kevin, the United States, it's it's no secret is doing horribly in those areas of dominion in which our economy is very much dependent, math and science. We doing horrible against the world in math and science. You want to know who's doing better in uh Science than us? Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, England, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia. Slovenia, Hong Slovenia. Kong, and I Russia. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what does that tell you? These about- are like third world countries. Some of not Japan, but some of these countries are roughly third world nations, and they're doing better than we are in math and science. But when our economy we've depends, got common core. We got common core. When our economy right now depends on things like computers and smartphones and information, and we're at the bottom in real science. Mm-hmm. When I'm talking about real science, I'm talking about the chemistry used to build those chips that go into the PCs and into the mm-hmm. smartphones. I'm talking about the physics required to move electricity from one place to another. I'm talking about engineering. I mean, real sciences, not once upon a time, a rock turned into a prince kind right. of science, mm-hmm. but the kind of science where you apply a voltage to a conductor mm-hmm. and you get a voltage and a current at the other end and you can do some work. Yeah. You know, work being kind of important. Um, we're also doing just as badly in math. Now, why are we doing so bad in science and math? Could it be that our education establishment is not made up by people who are good at science and math? Well, that that and the fact that that's not their goal. Dave, you know that's not the goal. The goal is properly socialized minions. That's the goal. Properly socialized minions. But, but they're minions who are bad at math, which is yeah. the only way you're going to end up with right. a twenty trillion dollar debt or a twenty four right. trillion dollar debt, right. depending how you calculate it. Dave, I mean, I think I think when it comes down to it, the nation is is committing suicide. I mean, I, you know, I, I understand that a lot of people out there are saying now they don't mean to be committing suicide. They, they that's not the intention. You know, economically, socially, educationally, our nation is not about committing suicide. But I'm I'm arguing the case, friends. That's what's happening. We're committing epistemological suicide when we're saying there is no basis, no absolute for truth or reality, or there is no ultimate telos or purpose for life. If, if that's being pounded into the brains of tens of millions of kids sitting through secular philosophy classes and their, their undergrad and their grad college classes, when they, they finally realize that they're, the underlying epistemology – of of the system out there is there is no purpose, there is no absolute, there is no reason, there is no basis for language, there's no basis for ethics, there's no basis, there's no fundamental basis for anything. And, and as, at, at the end, friends, you wind up with people self-destructing when it comes to their own educational standards, self-destructing when it comes to uh, a purpose for continuing on and, and building empires and, and providing for future economies. Why else are we going into $100 trillion of debt? Dave, we interviewed Dennis Peacock a couple of days ago. And uh, Dennis had a meeting with a bunch of high-up economists uh, somewhere in the United States. A lot of these people, he said, the common names uh, of uh, big shots. And they they all came together and they're talking about the future. They said, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. We're in uncharted territory now. (laughs) Never been in $100 trillion of debt before. (laughs) I don't know what's going to happen now. Never gone 187 miles per hour up against a uh, a iceberg before. I wonder what happens when we go kaboom. Well, like they say, when you jump off the building, it's fun. Yeah, uh, at the 
100th floor. It's fun at the 90th floor. Yeah, it's fun 80th, at the 80th floor. 70th, yeah. Picking up speed. It's still yeah, fun at the 50th fun, floor. Yeah. yeah. One uh, half GT squared. You're making it work. Uh, you know, at the bottom yeah. of the bottom, though, there there could be a bounce and it may not be a positive one. Mm-hmm. One of the problems with centralization, um, and you alluded to this, Kevin, is that those who are the real doers of society, the real innovators, the people who work at Google and Apple who build neat things, the people who come up with innovations, most of those them, people. Yeah. Those people can't be here. They, they have to be able to succeed. Mo, they, mo, most of them, Dave, most of them never graduated from college. Well, most cert- of the people actually do things. The ones, the CEOs okay. do. I'm talking about some of the engineers. Okay. I, I'm talking yeah, about okay, you know, the, the rank and file. The okay. rank and file who are mm-hmm. doing the work, who are really, they're, they're innovating at a technological level. Those people will, their creativity and their ability will not be enhanced by a program. Rather, it'll be stifled mm-hmm. uh, by a program like Common Core. Rather than let the eagles soar, you're telling the eagles that they got to stay on the ground with the turkeys. Yep. And, and, you know, that is the lowest common denominator thing. That's, that's devastating. Thanks, Dave. There are people who make it out of the box. I mean, think of Louis Lamore. He, he gets bored of school at 11 years of age. He gets bored of school and he travels the world and becomes the most famous novelist of all time. He sold more, according to my Guinness Book of World Records, he sold more novels than anybody else. Traveled the world at 11 years of age. Got out of, just got out of there. And you think about uh, the guy who developed the, the lights. Um, Edison. Edison, yeah, Thomas Edison. I mean, he, he was in school till he was 10 or 11, got out, got out of there. His mom gave him a chemistry set, and at 16, he had his first patent. I mean, Dave, I mean, thankfully, some people get out of the box. I'm so thankful some people get out of the box, because when they get out of the box, when, when they realize that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to education— and they get out there and start applying the things they've learned. This life integration element of education is so vitally important. I bring it out in my book, Upgrade the Ten Secrets to the Best Education. would encourage you to get it. I, I'm getting to the very core of what it takes to have a phenomenal education that actually can get out there and, and, and take some dominion of God's green earth. I mean, not to become the bureaucrat and push paper on the 47th floor and the 147th cubicle of some large bureaucracy somewhere where you're not doing anything productive, okay? That, th- those kinds of people are being ground out by our educational systems by the tens of millions. I'm talking about people actually do stuff. People actually invent things. People make things. People who understand the disciplines of engineering and and statistics and, and quality and, 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 and art manufacturing and, literature. and art and literature and everything else. You know, I'm talking about people who learn things and then they get out there and they actually do some things that are productive and helpful for human society. Uh, That's not happening in schools. Why? Because for the most part, these large centralized systems ignore the principle of individuality. They ignore the principle of life integration. They ignore the principles of discipleship and mentorship that are vitally important, found in the book of Proverbs, found in James chapter 1, and I summarize them in my book, Upgrade the Ten Secrets to the Best Education for Your Child. And, and the form of education most people get is an impoverished education. I don't like Mark Twain a lot, but I do like one little quote he came up with. Don't let your education, or get, don't let your schooling get in the way of a good education. Don't let your schooling get in the way of a good education. I mean, it's, it's exactly right. Sometimes schooling gets in the way of good education. And I think, Dave, it happens a lot and, and largely because not every kid is made to sit down there bolded to a chair for six hours every single day and, and learn in the same pattern as dictated by Bill Bennett and the National Department of Education and the Common Core. Exactly, team. Kevin. People learn things differently. They learn different ways. They learn it in different processes. Some people will learn it out of a book and then they'll be able to apply it. Some people will learn it in a lab first. Some people will learn inductively. Some will learn deductively. We, we talk about modes of learning. But, you know, there is this one school. It's called the School of Experience and the School of Hard Knocks. That's been traditionally the best school there is. But the longer we put children and adults and more and more 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds in these universities, the further from the school of experience they are, they're no longer working as interns. They're no longer just out there emptying the trash for a corporation, seeing how things work, seeing how the business comes. They're, They're not in the school of experience, in the school of hard knocks, Often enough, and more than that, Kevin, is that one factor that's so very important to education is the emotional environment. 
The emotional environment is is the great factor for a child's ability to to relax enough, feel comfortable enough to try and learn new things, including failing. If you have the very best teacher, if you go get the teacher of the year from the whole country and you put your student under that teacher, it will have no effect, virtually no effect, unless they're under that teacher long enough to have a relationship. I believe yeah. the experts say three years, three to four years, three yeah. to four years. Yeah. Now, so even, even in that case, the emotional environment is one of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Where is a child best, um, best suited to have an emotional peace, the ability to fail, still feel loved, the ability to learn and, and soak it in. Well, I, I suggest that's amongst this family. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's not what this educational system is about. This education system is about f- of packing facts in the brains of these automatons. You just force the facts in like you're forcing facts into a hard drive. There is no relationship. There's no life integration. There's no principal individuality. You just get 40 kids in a classroom and you force uh, 1,247 facts into their brains, disconnected facts. It's always better if they're disconnected facts, so they're effectively useless when they get out into the, the economy. And, and, and you call that education. It's, it doesn't do any good, and it, it ultimately will break down empires. Dave, here's, here's an example to break down of the empire. Here's an expert for Common Core. She's getting up and explaining it to some folks out in Grace Lake, Illinois. And uh, here's her quote. But even under the new Common Core, if... Even if they said three times four is 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning, explain how they came up with their answer, really in words and oral explanations, and they showed it in a picture, but they just got the final number wrong, we're more focusing on the how and the why. Okay, so now she goes on and says, you know, yeah, yeah, it's probably good to get the right answer, but that's not the real thing. Really what it's all about is 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 how they came up with Three times four is 11. I the, can do that. Because the method is way, way more interesting in a pra- oh, pragmatism, a, a philosophy of pragmatism than, than the end itself. I can do this. The end is not I can do this. Okay. I just have to work in the base 11 number system, and the answer is 1-1. One, one. Okay. Well, there you go. And I'm right. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And you're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was public school educated. I I, th- I think I deserve a gold star it, for that. You did it. Can yeah. I have extra recess time? Okay. Well, these are the teachers' friends that are out there teaching your students. They're they're just interested in your students coming up with novel and innovative ways to get the wrong answer. <laughs> yes, but they feel good about they it. They do, and that's important. It, yeah. It's values yeah. clarification, and yeah. they've clarified their values. Mm-hmm. And their value is not so much about being right; it's being close. Mm-hmm. what's a couple billion dollars or a trillion dollars amongst friends dave here's another story i know it's somewhat disconnected but here's a georgia school that's keeping a display up called uh, the god is dead posters the god is dead posters staying up in a georgia high school alcove high school and apparently it's 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 from arthur miller's play the crucible it made my daughter uncomfortable crystal mitchell a student's parent told my fox atlanta.com if my child can't pray in school and they're taking religion out of school for this to be plastered on the walls of school is a huge concern for me. Now, now here's, here's my question for Crystal. Here's my question for Crystal. Okay. They can't pray in the school, can't fear God, can't, can't worship, can't thank God, uh, can't have any religion, can't have any God in the science and the history classrooms. But now she's all upset about the God is dead posters. I mean, come on, Crystal. I mean, come on. You sent your daughters into these institutions, these religious establishments Mm -hmm. that have established the case that there is no God and their metaphysic does not allow for a God. And and Dave, apparently it was all part of the the, the Crucible play. It's a pro witch, pro communist initiative right, called right. Uh, the Crucible. And so it's a line from the play that's on this poster. It's yeah. not the main part of the poster. No. It's just one of the lines from the play. It's a, a particularly incendiary phrase that they put yeah. on the poster to get attention to get kids to the thing. Look, Christians need to wise up. If you're in a godless place, yeah. don't be surprised if it's godless. Exactly, exactly. And which is worse, God is dead or God is irrelevant? <laughs> which is worse? <laughs> God is dead or God's totally irrelevant. And God, the more if the God's more, irrelevant, then God's not God. Okay? Then you don't have to declare God is yeah. dead. The more they're saying God is dead, the more they fight the presence of God, the yeah. omnipresence of God, the more yeah. they're acknowledging that they're fighting something that must be real and threatening yeah. to them. The more they're acknowledging God and they're just confessing that they're a fool. It might be more helpful for them just to ignore him and to say God's irrelevant, which is really the ultimately what the schools are doing all the time. Get your kids out of these schools if they do not fear God. OK, if a school doesn't fear God, get them out. If the teachers don't fear God and teach the students to fear God as the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. They're bad teachers. Get away from them. 
Okay, I think I think that's one of the fairest statements anybody can make on this program. No one could say that I'm narrowing the application. And I know there are a lot of Christians that keep their kids in these these uh, public schools that refuse to worship and praise and and fear the true and living God. But I say get your kids out of these places. And give your children an education in the fear of God. By the way, I've done a, an extensive survey of what the church fathers, all the way back to the first couple, two, three centuries, have said about education for kids. Inevitably, 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 it's teach your children the fear of God as the beginning of wisdom and knowledge in their education. Whatever you do, don't give them any other kind of a pagan education that is absent of the fear of God, even the education based in the ideas of Plato and Aristotle. This is what the church fathers have said and I'm standing on 2,000 years of decent Orthodox Christianity when I say get your kids out of these foul secular schools that refuse to acknowledge God is important, let alone fear him and worship him. Kevin, I, I, it's hard to believe. I think teaching your kids the fear of God is even more important than teaching them math. There it is. And, uh, and Solomon stands with you, as does God, assuming that the book of Proverbs is inspired, and I believe it is. All right, grab a copy of my book, Upgrade the Ten Secrets to the Best Education for Your Child, at our website, kevinswanson.com. If you're interested in a good education for your children, if you're a parent and you're concerned about your kids and you love your kids, this is a very, very important area of, in fact, probably the most important area of, of inquiry you should ever, ever engage in your entire lifetime. Get into the issue of education. Be sure you get into it. Be sure you get a couple of good books on the issue because you as a parent, mom, dad, you are responsible before almighty God for the kind of education you give your children. I recommend you get some good books on what constitutes a biblical education, a good education. And one of the books I would recommend is mine, Upgrade the 10 Secrets to the Best Education for Your Child. Available at my website, kevinswanson.com. Again, upgrade. Get it now at kevinswanson.com. This is Kevin Swanson inviting you back again next time as we continue to lay down a vision for the next generation. 